Okay, and for that reason, we're going to have a look at Compton scatter and at the energy window. And uh, the problem exists also in SPECT, of course. So um, here is the uh, SPECT uh, scatter. So suppose we have a patient here and we want to make an image of the heart. And what we want to see is photons emitted in the right direction and traveling without any interaction, hitting the crystal, preferably photoelectric effect here, creating the red projections. Again, this is what we call attenuation. So a photon was traveling in the right direction, so we want to see it, but it interacts with an electron and is Compton scattered in a different direction, and so we lose it for detection. And this is exactly the same effect, but now we call it scatter because this was a photon we did not want to see. It's traveling in the wrong direction, but after scatter uh, interaction, it travels nicely through the collimator and gets detected. And as you can see, the heart, which is sitting here, can now contribute photons all over the place. So we get a very wide, relatively smooth uh, contribution of the scatter. So it's dependent on the patient, but it's much smoother than the image uh, created by the, the trues or the, the primary photons. Now, to get an idea of these scatters, we can use a Monte Carlo simulator. <coughs> and so as you all know, I think, Monte Carlo simulator is basically uh, a way to compute very complicated integrals. So we have the differential equations. We would like to integrate them, but they're too difficult. We cannot. So for scatter, we know exactly the equations. The klein china equation tells us exactly all the probabilities that we need to know. But integrating the equations provided by klein china over a patient uh, accounting for this collimator is undoable. So instead, we play physics to integrate that. And so basically, the computer throws with the uh, weighted ties to decide what to do and says, yeah, let's emit a photon. And then he uh, lets the photon travel. And while the photon is traveling, he's generating random numbers to decide if the photon happens to interact with an electron or not, taking into account the electron density. So the chances are lower in the lung and uh, than in TCM. And every now and then, the computer will say, yes, here an interaction happens. And the probability should be the same as in real life. And then he lets a photon scatter. So if you do that often enough, then just like in a real measurement, uh, you will get a distribution. And ideally, the same happens as in a real scanner. But the advantage is, of course, that we know exactly what happened. And afterwards, we can ask the computer, now what happened? Where, what did we see? And so here, we have done that. And so the, uh, and, and here is the associated uh, energy spectrum of the detected photons. So we can ask the, the, the computer what the energy was seen by the detector, and the computer will reply it was the blue line. So here we know that these photons all were 140 kilo electron volt, but because of the poor energy resolution, this is uh, blurred with a full without maximum of about 10%, producing this blue line here. And then these are. Uh, created mostly by scatters. But now we can ask the Monte Carlo simulator, yes, OK, what did you see? The Monte Carlo simulator will, oh, sorry, that was the, the blue line was the Monte Carlo simulator. The gamma camera can also give us the spectrum. We can ask the gamma camera for every photon, what energy did you believe the photon had? And that's the black line. And you see that the black line deviates here. And the reason is that the gamma camera doesn't bother to uh, store these low energy photons, but the simulator happily continues. So, but we don't care because we never use these photons here. And then you see here that in the real gamma camera, every now and then photons are detected with more than 140, really way more than 140 kilo electron volt, and that doesn't happen in the simulator. Any reason where these photons are coming from? Any idea where these are coming from? Could it be a signal pile up, Johan? Yeah, so more than one photon arrives, and the gamma camera thinks they arrive at the same time. So the scintillation of the first is still busy while the scintillation of the second is added, and those energies are added. And since most of the photons will have less than 140 kilo electron volt, the, the probability of the or, the, or the, the average value of the pileup is 
much lower than 280. So every now and then it will happen that two primary photons arrive, but the probability is much higher that the lower photons are combined. So they end up here, which is a reason to uh, check the energy and not only reject the low energy photons, but also the high energy photons. The, the simulator didn't bother to simulate such effects. Now we can ask the Monte Carlo simulation, what was the, uh, just show us the spectrum of the primary photons only, the ones that didn't interact in the patient. And that's this uh, orange uh, uh, line here. And then these are the scatter contributions. So this line here is the energy distribution, the, the measured energy distribution of the photons that scattered once in the patient. And this line is the contribution of photons that scattered more than once in the patient. So we see that the yeah, and then we, we acquire photons within this energy window. And the aim of that energy window is to get as many truths as possible, as many primary photons as possible, and to reject as many scattered photons as possible. And so for example, we can use this uh, window here indicated by that uh, shaded rectangle. But if we do that, you see that there is a significant contribution of scatters. We could make the window smaller, but then we would see fewer truths. Okay, and so this tells us that the contribution inside the primary window is dominated fortunately by primary photons, and then the next important contribution is photons that scattered only once. All right, and so based on that information, um, scatter window subtraction has been proposed, and this has been invented many times. The first that I'm aware of is uh, Ronald Jessak, but after that, the same thing or almost the same thing was invented uh, repeatedly by other people. And so the idea is to look at the energy and acquire more than one energy window. So we tell the gamma camera that we want to see photons that are in the primary energy window uh, positioned around the photopeak. And that will con consist of two contributions, the, the primary photons, this is the point spread function we want to have. But then there is also a contribution of scattered photons and that will be wider because they didn't follow a straight line, they can follow broken lines. And this one we want to subtract. So then we tell the gamma camera, we also want to see the photons in an energy window just below that primary window. And that will be a blob of course, because it's just scattered photons, there will be almost no primary photons there. And then our hope is that that blob is similar to this blob. We could add more windows, but the lower we go, the wider this block will be, and the more different the behavior of these scattered photons is from the ones that contributed in the primary uh, window. Okay, so the hope is that this is a good estimate of that, and that leads to, for example, the triple energy window approach, which is very popular uh, on gamma cameras. So you acquire in the central window called C1 here, which is the primary photopy. And then for correction, you add two very narrow uh, additional windows in which you acquire uh, photons. C2 is for scatters, and C3 is uh, just to be sure. There are um, uh, isotopes that will emit more than one photon. And so if you, for example, thallium is one of those, if you acquire in the lower primary uh, photo peak, then you will, in that photo peak, also get contributions, scattered contributions from the higher photo peak. Just, just in case that that is present, you could put a, a window here, which will then see the scattered contributions coming from higher energies to this C3. And then we assume that these two windows provide some information of the undesired photons, and hopefully the spatial distribution in those windows is the same as the spatial distribution of these undesired windows, uh, photons in that primary window here. So we take C2 plus C3, we filter it a bit and multiply it with a constant and subtract it. The reason to filter it is that we have to go for a compromise here. We would like this window to be as narrow as possible because the narrower we, we make it, the more similar the behavior will be of the photons in this window, uh, uh, the more similar behavior we will see in, in both windows for the scattered photons. The wider we make it, the more the scattered photons will be different from those. 
But of course, if we make the window narrower and narrower, we will get fewer photons. So these windows will require noisy data because they don't see many photons. But we know scatter is typically smooth, so we can get away with a lot of smooth. And then we have to adjust, uh, multiply this with a constant, which will be typically larger than Unity because these windows are very small. And we need to compensate for the lower sensitivity of these two windows compared to the primary. So you could do some calculations for that, but many people prefer to do phantom measurements because that takes into account for everything also complicated stuff that you may not have in your calculations. So this thing is provided on most gamma cameras. And here you see that uh, in this case, I was for Tallium. Triple energy window applied. So Tallium is a, a tracer that in the past was very often used for cardiac imaging because the Tallium itself has very nice properties as a flow tracer, but its energies are not ideal. So this has been replaced by technetium label tracers, uh, which produce nice energies. Okay, and here you see the um, window acquired in the photo peak in the primary energy window. And then there is the lower and the high. So this would be window C1, this is window C2, the one below the photo peak, and this is window C3, the one above the photo peak. And then these two are smooth scaled, subtracted from this one to produce this one. And here you see the same images, but now all scaled to their own maximum, so you see better what they look like. And then you can see that um, after correction, for example, the, so this is the wall of the left ventricle imaged with poor resolution because this is an old slide and Tallium is not an ideal isotope. But we know that at the time that this image is taken, the blood is cold. So there should be no activity inside the heart. And you see that there is activity here, but now it's corrected to zero here. So that's good. We see that in that lower energy window, the resolution is much worse than in that higher energy window. That is logical because what we see is scattered photons there. So that is fine. So this should be a reasonable estimate of the scatter in here. And then we see that in that higher energy window, actually the resolution is just as good as in the primary window. So that Tallium has these two energy peaks. So it probably has seen some scatter from the higher energy window, but it actually saw more truths than uh, scatters. So, which is why it has excellent resolution. So probably we don't need that window here for time. So two things you can see from that. If you want quantification, then this image is better than that one. But if you want just visual inspection, then uh, these images are equivalent. We know that the blood pool is cold, so it doesn't matter that there's a little bit of activity in here. And in cardiology, typically, you want to see if there is nice uniform uptake in the left ventricle or not. If there would be a big infarction, we would easily detect it in both images. So if for visual inspection, the scatter correction is not mandatory. For quantification, you would have to do it. OK, now we can have a look um, in PET. <coughs> and yeah, I've been lazy. I'm still using a slide from 1999. And that is uh, acquired on BGO. But it illustrates the difference between SPECT. And the difference is, of course, that we have two photons now. So we have a two-dimensional energy distribution, energy of photon one, energy of photon two. And the interesting photons are the ones that didn't scatter in both cases. So we have a peak here. And then here we have photons that didn't scatter, uh, where, where this photon didn't scatter, but this one did. And another difference you see is that this peak is much wider than that peak, which was true for PGO. At that time, the energy resolution of PET was about 20%. But in the meantime, with LSO, uh, LYSO, the energy resolution is now very close to 10%. So very similar as the Megama camera. Yes, and because at the time that uh, we went from 2D scanning, so the scanners with the SEPTA to fully 3D scanners, the scan without SEPTA, all PET systems had BGO. And so in the beginning, people tried to do exactly the same as in SPEC, using uh, energy windows below the photo peak. So you would look at those photons here to estimate the contribution of scatters in your image. And it turned out not to work at all or at least to give poor results. And one of the reasons is that the energy at that time was very bad. So that means that your 
second window had to be much lower than your primary window. And that means that the behavior of the scatters you measure in that scatter window is very different from the behavior of the scatters in your primary window. So that's one reason why this correction was not very good. And so after struggling with that, they decided it's not good enough and it was abandoned in favor of another approach, which was uh, proposed by uh, Jim Ollinger. Quite a long time ago, I must admit. And um, he proposed to compute the scatter uh, from simulations. So suppose you have an attenuation map. And these days we always have it because you have a, typically a bad CT scan. So you take your CT image. So you know the uh, attenuation coefficients at 5.11 because you convert the CT values to 5.11 uh, attenuation coefficients. And then you make a first estimate of your activity distribution. So now I have an activity image and an attenuation image, and I can start in principle among the cattle simulation. So I could uh, look at all possible emission sites, compute the probability of having a photon going in that direction, another one here, scattering here, and producing a scatter here. If I do that for many, many situations, I can estimate the scatter I should have. Having that, I can correct my, I can make a better image by correcting for that scatter. Then I get a better estimate of my activity. And then I can do this again to get a better and still better estimate of the scatter and iterate that over and over again. Now that, if you do that with Monte Carlo simulate, that will take a few days. You don't want to do that. So Jim Ollinger showed that you could take all kinds of shortcuts, variance reduction methods, such that instead of many hours, he could do the job in minutes at that time, and this, that would now be seconds. So one of the tricks he uses is that scatter is smooth, so we don't need very small voxels here. We can use big voxels and big detectors, and that reduces the dimension dramatically. Then he assumes that uh, double scatter is very rare, so we can ignore it altogether. We can just assume that one of the photons uh, will net not scatter and only the other one scatters. And doing that gives us enough information or, or gives us already good estimate of the scatters. And with all these tricks, he showed that um, he can, uh, well, he is comparing here a measurement, which, which is this one, to his estimated scatter. And he estimated scatter with a full Monte Carlo simulation, then with a high sampling. So that means. Uh, a Monte Carlo simulator with dramatic variance induction, but still pretty good and slow. And then a very aggressive one, the one he proposes for clinical uh, uh, application. And his conclusion based on these graphs was that um, the results are pretty good and that it does a good job in estimating this curve. And then this method, variations of this method have been uh, implemented in all PET scanners of all companies. Now, one problem with that approach is that um, you cannot account for what happens outside the field of view. So it's possible that a photon, um, which is, or a, a positron emitter sitting outside the field of view, sending a photon in your camera. And then there is a scatter here, and a lot of photon also gets in your camera. And the simulation cannot know it unless you also measure this part. So in total body imaging, in principle, you could do that, although currently most companies don't because it's complicated. And very often we just do, for example, a brain scan or a cardiac scan, and then we have no clue of the activity outside, so we cannot do this. So that is one reason to put SEPTA at the uh, front and back end of the scanner. But again, you don't want to put large SEPTA because then the patient doesn't fit in it. And in an MR, you probably don't want to put SEPTA at all because all that metal uh, will uh, influence your magnetic field. So people have been checking how much damage this does. And the conclusion is that it does damage, but mostly at the edge and inside the, in the center of the field of view, the damage is limited. And as scanners are getting longer and longer, we assume that the damage done by this is uh, less and less. But still, the damage is considerable near the edges. And so in the uh, Ollinger approach, all kinds of tricks like scaling the scatter have been applied to in an attempt to correct for this. Again, as I said previously, this is actually not a fully solved problem. So current solutions are not too bad, but they're not 
very accurate and every now and then you can see that they have problems and that there is definitely still uh, under or over corrected scatter in your final, which is 